Hi guys. Before I was so rudely interrupted by these clueless fucking morons, I was halfway through this week's doomsday sermon right after sermonizing about all I want to be do, all I want is to be left alone by fucking clueless morons. What happens in the middle of my sermon in a one million acre forest, these clueless morons arrive on the scene. But anyway, I'm just going to pick up where I left off. So this would be part two of my Sunday, August 6, 2017 sermon from my new favorite Bible of the Apocalypse, Tropic of Cancer, from fellow doomsday prophet Henry Miller writing everything I'm about to say in the 1930s. Let's call it 85 years ago. So I think when I was so interrupted, we were talking about uh, Henry, who really was born in New York. This is his, uh, he's now living in Paris as a young man, but he's thinking about his childhood <clears throat> returning to the sermon. When I think of this city where I was born and raised, this Manhattan that Whitman sang of, a blind, white rage licks my guts. New York, the white prisons, meaning the buildings, the sidewalks swarming with maggots, the bread lines, the opium joints that are built like palaces, the kikes that are there, the lepers, the thugs, and above all, the NUI, the monotony of faces, streets, legs, houses, skyscrapers, meals, posters, jobs, crimes, loves, a whole city erected over a hollow pit of nothingness, meaningless, absolutely meaningless, and 42nd Street, the top of the world, they call it. Where's the bottom, then? You can walk along with your hands out, and they'll put cinders in your cap. Rich or poor, they walk along with heads thrown back, and they almost break their necks looking up at their beautiful white prisons. They walk along like blind geese in the searchlights, spray their empty faces with flecks of ecstasy. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so in this chapter, he's, you know, he's, he's totally broke on the uh, streets of Paris, and he meets up with this Russian guy who offers him a job teaching English, and he's absolutely thrilled to get this job, and then he goes home to a, a meal uh, with his new boss, and this is what he encounters with, uh, with Serge. The meal over, the guests rush away. They rush away precipitously as if they feared a plague. Serge and I are left with the dogs. His wife has fallen asleep on the couch. Serge moves about unconcernedly, scraping the garbage for the dogs. Dogs like very much, he says. Very good for dogs. Little dog, he has worms. He is too young yet. Serge bends down to examine some white worms lying on the carpet between the dog's paws, tries to explain about the worms in English, but his vocabulary is lacking. Finally, he consults the dictionary. Ah, he says, looking at me exultantly, tapeworms. My response is evidently not very intelligent. Serge is confused. He gets down on his hands and knees to examine them better. He picks one up and lays it on the dining table beside the fruit. Huh, him not very big, he grunts. Next lesson you learn me worms. No, you are guide teacher. I make progress with you. 
lying on the mattress in the hallway, the odor of germicide stifles me. A pungent, acrid odor that seems to invade every pore of my body. The food begins to repeat on me. The Quaker oats, the mushrooms, the bacon, the fried apples. I see the little tapeworm lying beside the fruit and all the variety of worms that Serge drew on the tablecloth to explain what was the matter with his dog. I see the empty pit of the Fole Birge, whatever that means, and in every crevice there are cockroaches and lice and bed bugs. I see people scratching themselves frantically, scratching until their blood comes. I see worms crawling over the scenery like an army of red ants devouring everything in sight. I see the chorus girls throwing away their gauze tunics and running through the aisles naked. I see the spectators in the pit throwing off their clothes also and scratching each other like monkeys. <laughs> oh God. And so this next scene, he, he stumbles upon and, and finds a, a free ticket. Uh, he stumbles upon a free ticket to the uh, to this classical it's not exactly an opera some sort of classical symphony where all of these rich folks in Paris uh, go so he he finds himself uh, with the cream of of Paris's citizenry at the uh, at the symphony uh, where to start uh, there is, so it's, it's intermission. There is a buzz now and all those who want to cough, cough to their heart's content. There is the noise of feet shuffling and seats slamming, the steady frittering noise of people moving about aimlessly, of people fluttering their programs and pretending to read and then dropping their programs and scuffling under their seats thankful for even the slightest accident which will prevent them from asking themselves what they were thinking about because if they knew they were thinking about nothing at all, they would go mad. In the harsh glare of the lights, they look at each other vacuously and there is a strange tenseness with which they stare at one another and the moment the conductor wraps again, they fall back into a cataleptic state. They scratch themselves unconsciously, or they remember suddenly a show, win a, a show window, and I, I think he meant to say a shop window, in which there was displayed a scarf or a hat. And I am uh, once again being invaded. But, you know, guys, I have been down here for 24 hours, 24 hours w w without being uh, interrupted one time in 24 hours. I sit down to try to do my Sunday sermon and am completely invaded by clueless morons. I think these people are, uh, they're, they're, they're giving me the, the evil eye. Like, what in the hell is this weirdo doing down there? I think they're discussing me between themselves. Uh, and it looks like they're getting in their monster truck. And, uh, yes, I, I think I have scared off the, uh, the clueless morons in their monster truck. So if they can get out of here without... Uh, running over my stove y y you know it it's just unbelievable putting up with clueless fucking morons in the wilderness it it's one thing uh, to be in a city dealing with other people 
but but I'm out here in one million fucking acres trying to hang out with Bigfoot, and all I get is Duck Dynasty and, and their fucking monster trucks. Anyway, I think I'm I'm not going to start this uh, over a third time. Okay, yeah, let's get back to the uh, the clueless moron rich people at the uh, symphony in Paris 85 years ago. The moment the conductor raps again, they fall back into a cataleptic state. They scratch themselves unconsciously, or they remember suddenly a shop window in which there was displayed some scarf or hat. They remember every detail of that window with amazing clarity, but where it was exactly, they can't recall, and that bothers them keeps them wide awake, restless, and they listen now with redoubled attention because they are wide awake, and no matter how wonderful the music is, they will not lose consciousness of that shop window and that scarf that was hanging there. Or was it a hat? <laughs> Oh, God. I, 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 anyway, guys, uh, then, then he goes off and uh, uh, <laughs> the guy is hilarious. He, he's flat out uh, hilarious. But uh, and so finally, uh, all the rich people are, are falling asleep during the symphony. Sleep is the keynote. No one is listening anymore. It's impossible to think and listen, impossible to dream even when the music itself is nothing but a dream. Anyway, guys, I got, I got too much to cover here. I would love to, uh... <laughs> anyway, I, I could pretty much stop anywhere. Uh... <clears throat> Let's see, this is when he is, uh, he, he, I'm going to finish up with his long chapter on Hindus, on um, people from India. Uh, apparently, Henry Miller uh, was not, in, not enraptured w w with people of, of India. Uh, I, uh, okay, and, and you got to remember, this is 85 years ago when I guess the population of India was about one-third of what it is now. <clears throat> the walls of the little room in which we are sitting are crammed with photographs. Every branch of his family is represented. It is like a cross-section of the Indian Empire. For the most part, the members of this genealogical tree look like withered leaves. The women are frail and they have a startled, frightened look in their eyes. The men have a keen, intelligent look like educated chimpanzees. They are all there, about 90 of them, with their white bullocks, their dung cakes, their skinny legs, their old-fashioned spectacles. In the background, now and then, one catches a glimpse of the parched soil of a crumbling pediment of an idol with crooked arms, a sort of human centipede. There is something so fantastic, so incongruous about this gallery that one is reminded of the great spawn of temples which stretch from the Himalayas to the tip of Ceylon, a vast jumble of architecture, staggering in beauty and at the same time monstrous, hideously monstrous, because the fecundity which seethes and ferments in the myriad ramifications of designs seems to have exhausted the very soil of India itself, looking at the seething, the seething hive of figures which swarm the facades of the temples. One is overwhelmed by the potency of these dark, handsome people 
who mingled their mysterious streams in a sexual embrace that lasted 30 centuries or more. These frail men and women with piercing eyes who stare out of the photograph seem like the emaciated shadows of those virile, massive figures who incarnated themselves in stone and fresco from one end of the India to the other in order that the heroic myths of the races who here intermingled should remain forever entwined in the hearts of their countrymen. When I look at only a fragment of these spacious dreams of stone, these toppling sluggish edifices studded with gems coagulated with human sperm, I am overwhelmed by the dazzling splendor of those imaginative flights which enabled half a billion, half a billion, now 1.2 billion people of diverse origins to thus incarnate the most fugitive expressions of their longing. There you go. Uh, the young Hindus, so that's the, you know, so he's, he's looking out, you know, at, at the pictures of the, uh, of the former Indian people, and now it's the reign of Gandhi when he was writing this, and this was Doomsday Prophet uh, Henry Miller looking beyond Gandhi. The young Hindu, of course, is optimistic. He has been to America, and he has been contaminated by the cheap idealism of Americans, contaminated by the ubiquitous bathtub, the five and 10 cent store bric-a-brac, the bustle, the efficiency, the machinery, the high wages, the free libraries, etc., etc. His ideal would be to Americanize India. He is not at all pleased with Gandhi's retrogressive mania. Forward, he says, just like a YMCA man. As I listen to his tales of America, I see how absurd it is to expect of Gandhi that miracle which will deroute the trend of destiny. India's enemy is not England, but America. India's enemy is the time spirit, the hand which cannot be turned back. Nothing will avail to offset this virus which is poisoning the whole world. America is the very incarnation of doom. She will drag the whole world down to the bottomless pit. How about that? for Doomsday Prophecy from 1935 when America was uh, in, a, in the depression and Gandhi was trying to hold back the Americanization, the virus of India, China, and the rest of the world. Oh. Uh. Uh, and uh, so anyway, here in this final long scene, I hope my battery doesn't run out, to set the, the scene, he is, he is visiting a whorehouse with this young Hindu guy from India when uh, Henry, or the uh, character in the book, which this is an autobiography, it all suddenly occurs to him, sitting in this French whorehouse 
with this horny young Indian uh, what the, the game's all about. So hopefully the, the uh, battery and the camera will last because this is going to take a few minutes. For a fraction of a second, perhaps, I experienced that utter clarity which the epileptic, it is said, is given to know. In that moment, I lost completely the illusion of time and space. The world unfurled its drama simultaneously along a meridian which had no axis. In this sort of hair-trigger eternity, I felt that everything was justified, supremely justified. I felt the wars inside me that had left behind this pulp and rack. I felt the crimes that were seething here to emerge tomorrow in blatant screamers. I felt the misery that was grinding itself out with pestle and mortar, the long, dull misery that dribbles away in dirty handkerchiefs. On the meridian of time, there is no injustice. There is only the poetry of motion creating the illusion of truth and drama. If at any moment, anywhere, one comes face to face with the absolute, that great symphony which makes men like Gautama and Jesus seem divine, freezes away. The monstrous thing is not that men have created roses out of this dung heap, but that for some reason or other they should want roses. For some reason or other man looks for the miracle and to accomplish it he will wade through blood. He will debauch himself with ideas. He will reduce himself to a shadow if for only one second of his life he can close his eyes to the hideousness of reality. Everything is endured. Disgrace, humiliation, poverty, war, crime, ennui. He loves this word ennui. It's repeated over and over again in the Tropic of Cancer. Everything is endured in the belief that overnight something will occur, some miracle which will render life tolerable. And all the while a meter is running inside and there is no hand that can reach in there and shut it off. All the while someone is eating the bread of life and drinking the wine, some dirty fat cockroach of a priest who hides away in the cellar guzzling it, while up above in the light of the street a phantom host touches the lips and the blood is pale as water, and out of this endless torment and misery no miracle comes forth. No microscopic vestige even of relief. Only ideas, pale, attenuated ideas, which have to be fattened by slaughter. Ideas which come forth like bile, like the guts of a pig when the carcass is ripped open. And so I think what a miracle it would be if this miracle which man attends eternally should turn out to be nothing more than these two enormous turds which the faithful disciple drop in the bidet. That was uh, alluding to a hilarious story which I can't get into. What if at the last moment when the banquet table is set and the symbols clash, there should appear suddenly and wholly without warning a silver platter on which even the blind could see that there is nothing more and nothing less than two enormous lumps of shit. That 
I believe would be more miraculous than anything which man has looked forward to. It would be miraculous because it would be undreamed of. It would be more miraculous than even the wildest dream because anybody could imagine the possibility, but nobody ever has, and probably nobody ever will again. And he, uh, good Lord, I gotta check the time, see if I have time. The battery thing is is going. Let's see, I'm, I'm racing the battery. Somehow, when the realization that nothing was to be hoped for had a salutary effect upon me for weeks and months, for years in fact, all my life I had been looking forward to something happening, some extrinsic event that would alter my life, and now suddenly inspired by the absolute hopelessness of everything, I felt relieved, felt as though a great burden had been lifted from my shoulders. Uh, at dawn I parted company with a young Hindu after hitting him up for a few francs enough for a room for the night. Walking towards Montparnasse, I decided to let myself drift with the tide to make not the least resistance to fate, no matter in what form it presented itself. Nothing that had happened to me thus far had been sufficient to destroy me. Nothing had been destroyed except my illusions. I myself was intact. There, the world was intact. Tomorrow there might be a revolution, a plague, an earthquake. Tomorrow there might not be left a single soul to whom one could turn for sympathy, for, for aid, for faith. It seemed to me that the great calamity had already manifested itself that I could be no more truly alone than this, than at this very moment. I made up my mind that I would hold on to nothing, that I would expect nothing, that henceforth I would live as an animal, a beast of prey, a rover, a plunderer. Uh, this goes on and on. By what? He calls the better part of his nature, man has been betrayed, that is all, <clears throat> at the extreme limits of his spiritual being, man finds himself again naked as a savage, when he finds God, as it were, he has been picked clean, he is a skeleton. Uh, there you go, uh, getting down to the bottom of this, racing the battery. My back is to the wall, I can retreat no further. As far as history goes, I am dead. If there is something beyond, I shall have to bounce back. I have found God, but He is insufficient. I am only spiritually dead. Physically, I am alive. Morally, I am free. The world which I have departed is a menagerie. The dawn is breaking on a new world, a jungle world, in which the lean spirits roam with sharp claws. If I am a hyena, I am a lean and hungry one. I go forth to fatten myself. And there we wind up with the end of the first half of Tropic of Cancer. What a, what a name, the Tropic of Cancer. And with that, I am going to uh, wind up part two of today's Doomsday Sermon from 
fellow Doomsday Prophet, Henry Miller. If, if you, like me, have never read Tropic of Cancer because you thought it was just a running porno story, which it kind of is, do yourself the favor, guys, and, uh, and, and get this book. And uh, I'm off to make a margarita for the end times. Bye, guys.